We're in a series on the seven deadly sins, and this week we are going to enter into that series in earnest and uh, begin by looking at the sin of pride. There are six more sins after pride, and we're going to talk about each of the sins, take it as a time to really search our hearts and, and figure out where do we need to be open to God's grace, but we're going to spend more time talking about the cures and looking at what does Scripture call us to, and what does Scripture prescribe for us as the way of life growing into the grace of Christ. So there are seven deadly sins classically in Christian thought, and there are seven cures to these sins. And so today we start with pride, and we're, we're looking at James, and, and James quotes the Proverbs, Proverbs 3.34, and if you want to just have your Bibles open, we're going to kind of walk right down through this passage, James chapter 4, 1 through 10, but James quotes Proverbs 3.34, and he says that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble, and James says a lot in this passage. Um, he, he wraps up his teaching in verse 10. I mean, I think it kind of comes down to this, where he says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. So James begins from this place where he's speaking about pride, and he works his way down to humility, to humbling ourselves before the Lord. And here's what we're going to learn today. We are, we are learning about humility, and we're going to focus on that last verse. Here's what we're learning Humble yourselves before the Lord. That is God's call to us in the Scriptures. Pride is the deadly sin, and humility is the cure. And so I just want to walk our way down through this passage. But pride has traditionally been regarded as the root of all the sins in Christian thought. So Gregory the Great, a, a writer in the 5th century, he calls pride the queen of sins, the root of all evil, the poisonous root. And Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages, he says that pride is opposed to all the virtues. And so all the other sins flow from pride. And we're going to talk about this in a bit, but it kind of makes sense to me because pride is what makes us think we don't need God. It's pride that makes us love something else, often ourselves, more than God. And even if in, just in the everyday, it's our own sense of self-importance and our own misplaced sense of self-worth that leads to anger, that, that gives us an excuse for greed or for lust, that gives us a license for gluttony, and, and I could go on. But they're all a form of pride. So just think about this. I mean, that pride is the root of the other six deadly sins. I mean, if you are going to pick a sin to work on, you might pick pride, right? And just kind of start with pride and say, where am I at with pride? That's a good place to start. And the scriptures call us to humility, to humble ourselves before the Lord, to not see ourselves as better than we ought, but to have a clear sense, listen to this, a clear sense of who we are in Christ Jesus. What is our identity? Because you see, these are really identity questions, and pride is about where we find our self worth. That's what it comes down to. And so this is, this is why James starts by asking in our scripture here today, in chapter 4, verse 1 of James, it's why he starts by asking, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, that battle within you? So there are, there are fights and there are quarrels that come from desire, and our desire flows from our own sense of who we are and, and what is Good. And so our desires always uh, can all too easily get disordered and can define us in disordered ways, which is exactly what James is talking about in verse 4. We use this really strong language, right? Where he says, You adulterous people. Um, he says, uh, that they're, they, they are, Don't they know friendship with the world is, not, is enmity with God? And he's saying that they are loving something else other than God. They're not staying true to God, to their covenant faithfulness to God. They're cheating on God, right? They're cheating on God with, with money, with prestige, with power, with their relationships. I mean, just fill in the blank for yourself because all of us do this at some place in our lives, cheat on God. We place our sense of identity in something else other than God. That's kind of the basic human problem. We take pride in something other than God. You see, God longs for us. Verse 5, um, do, you not, do you think the Scripture says without reason that the Spirit He caused to live in us 
envies intensely. I wouldn't quite translate it that way. I'm not sure envy is the right word, but the idea is that God yearns passionately for our spirits. God's created us. He wants to be in communion with us. What God desires more than anything else, and you see this throughout all the scriptures, right? Don't bring me sacrifice. Don't bring me rams. Don't bring me oil. Bring me yourself. That's what I want. What God longs for is the spirit that he has created within us, and that's what James is saying here. God yearns and jealously, intensely for what he's created. He's got a passionate desire for us, and God wants us to grow towards him. So verse 8, come near to God, he will come near to you. You take a step towards God, God runs to you. God desires to be with us. Verse 7, this is where James starts to lay it all out, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And so verses 7 to 10, these are really our most important verses for today. We have, we have this vision, okay, of the transformation that can happen. We are, we're called away from conflict, right? It starts off with conflict, quarrel, self-interest, pride, away from pride, away from the devil, away from sin, and towards this peace and humility with and before God. And, and what, what this really is, is a call to step back from all of those labels and all of those identities that our families and our neighbors and our world and sometimes ourselves, that we slap on ourselves and, that, and to find our truest identity in God. And so James is calling us back from our false identities based on our own self-sufficiency and desire to an identity rooted in pride to an identity that is in fact rooted and grounded in God. He's calling us to repentance and finding life in God. And this starts with humility, with humbling ourselves before the Lord. So verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. That is the key verse. And I want us to notice really carefully what that scripture is saying, if you're following along here. It's not just humble yourselves, right? Look at, look at it carefully. It's not just humble yourselves. I mean, sometimes, sometimes we get humbled in the worst way because sometimes other people will humble us. Maybe you've had this little you ever been put down? You ever had someone that doesn't recognize your worth and that treats you in a shabby way, that treats you bad? Sometimes we also can get humbled because we do something kind of stupid and we set ourselves up for it, and then we have to eat humble pie afterwards. Have you ever had humble pie? I, I have. And you can get to these false views of humility that, that where we think that what humility is, is believing that we're not really worth very much. But that is the lie of the devil. All of us are of supreme worth to God because all of us are worth Christ dying for us. And so it is not humility to have this view of ourselves of being of little worth or to allow others to tell us that, you know what, you're not worth much because you, you aren't the right age or you're not the right gender, or you don't have the right educational background or you're not from the right family. I don't think you're worth anything. That is a lie of the devil. We are worth the blood of Christ. And the Japanese who, who deeply value rice, they have this proverb that says, the heavier the head of rice, the deeper it bows, which is where we're getting our visual from today. It is because of our great worth in Christ that we are able to practice true humility. Now, now notice what it says here in James. He says, humble yourselves before the Lord and we will lift you up. It's not letting other people humble you. It's not letting other people tear you down. He's saying, humble yourselves before the Lord. So this is a humility that acknowledges who we really are before God. It's saying, to God be the glory. It's, it's what John the Baptist was getting at when he spoke to Jesus. He said, look, I, I've got to decrease. He's going to increase it's Mary's song of praise when she sings, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. This is us recognizing who we truly are before God, right? We are of deep worth before God. The heavier the head of rice, the deeper it bows. We are deep worth before God. It's not saying that we're not precious and valuable, but it's saying that God is of so much greater worth and worthiness, and that we then find our worth in Him. And this is why pride is so dangerous, because pride is a failure to recognize who we truly are before God. Listen to this. The Scriptures 
warn against pride in various places. You probably know some of these verses. Proverbs 11.2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but wisdom is with the humble. Proverbs 16.18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's the one where we say pride comes before the fall. Amos 6.8. I despise the pride and false glory of Israel, and I hate their beautiful homes. I will give this city and everything in it to the enemy. And of course, Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require but to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before the Lord? Mark 7, 22, Jesus lists pride among the evils that come from the human heart. In the Apocrypha, in the book of Tobit, we read, in pride there is ruin and great confusion, And so it's not just about being humble. It's not just being not proud. It is humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. In other words, it's it's in humility and finding our identity and who we truly are before God that we are raised up before God. We will have the best possible identity, the most exalted identity, that, that of children of God. We are sons and daughters of the King and that is the most perfect identity that we can possibly have this identity of growing into maturity into Christ. But think about this a little bit. I mean, is all pride really bad? Is all pride bad? I mean, what about taking pride in our work or being proud of an accomplishment that we really, you know, we poured blood, sweat, and tears into it. We really worked hard. What about being proud of something like that? Or what, what if we say we're proud of one of our children? Should we be proud to be, and then fill in the blank, should we be proud to be American or Kansan or farmer or et cetera, et cetera, you know, whatever it is in your life that, that gives you pride. Are those things okay or should we be cautious? And I think part of the problem is that the meaning of the word pride has shifted for us. And the original meaning of pride, the way that we really see pride used in the scriptures, it's more like arrogance or haughtiness. It's when someone thinks that they're better than others or better than who they are. And in the deepest sense, pride is when someone thinks that they're so great, so great that they don't need God. That's the way pride is really used in the scriptures. And we we kind of throw around this word pride, but it isn't really pride that we're talking about. I think like, for example, when we talk about a child and we say, you know, I am so proud of you, that what we're really saying is, I am pleased that you did a good job. We're expressing our approval of something. We're giving worth to something, to to someone. Or when we say we take pride in our work, I think what we're really meaning is that we have appropriately invested in our work and we have done it with a sense of fulfillment. We're giving worth to our work. We kind of mean what Paul meant when he talked in Colossians 3.23, right? He said, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as to the Lord, not to human beings. And and I think that really isn't pride. That's not what, that's not the same thing that the scriptures are talking about when we use the word pride. It's simply recognizing and naming the goodness of something. And I don't think in that sense it has to be bad. But what about pride in our identities? And here I think we've got to be careful because you know, what, what exactly do we mean when we say we're proud to be an American, for instance? Are we saying that we have a love for our neighbor and a love that then extends to our community and to our country? I mean, I think, I think that would be good. Or are we saying that we think we're better than other people because we're American? Well, that, that gets us into risky territory. And, and, I, and think about what a strange thing it is for us as followers of Jesus to say something like that anyway. I mean, we are called to find our identity in Christ. And, and anyway, it's not like we, before we were born, we kind of looked down from heaven and made a thorough examination of all the possible countries that were out there and said, right, I'm going to be born in America. I mean, we didn't have a choice. We were just born here. And we could have just as easily been born in South Sudan or China or Bolivia. And what I found is that everybody thinks that their country is the best. We've got to be careful because here's the thing. Pride is sneaky. It's woven right into who we are, into what we value most. It's hard to see. It's self-justifying. It defines us. And we will do a lot of things because of pride and not even recognize that it's pride that's driving us. 
We'll be easily offended because somebody's not recognizing how important we are. We'll, we'll get judgmental because we're, we're better than somebody else and we would have done things better than they did it. Or we'll take a little bit extra because, hey, it's me. I deserve more. And you know, I think, I think we maybe just are going to be better off to stay away from this language of pride and all that comes with it and simply get in the practice of noticing what is good and, and, and naming the goodness in what we see. So we can say to our kids, I think you did a good job, in the, a great job in the performance. Or we can say, I put my heart into my work. Or, you know, I feel that my sermon was just really awesome, as usual. <laughs> all, all of us need to work on that humility. We can just say things like that, right? Rather than using the word pride, and when we talk about our nation, we can express an appropriate love of country that flows from love of neighbor and care for all that God has created without making that our main identity or claiming that we're somehow better because we're American. We can be human beings created in the image of God, no less, no more, just like everybody else. We're called to humble ourselves before the Lord. Humility is the cure of pride. And so true humility focuses on God and gives glory to God and finds our identity before God. True humility isn't putting on airs of being less than who we are. It's following Paul's advice in Romans 12, 3, where he says, be honest in your estimate of yourselves, measuring your value by how much faith God has given you. Which is to say, recognize that life is a gift. That whatever accomplishments have come your way are because God has gifted you with intellect and strength and perseverance. Talk less about what you've accomplished and instead give thanks more. Be in the habit of saying, to God be the glory and there but by the grace of God go I. You know, when I've encountered humble people, I've been struck that they are not beat down people who tried to hide their accomplishments on the contrary, they're self-confident people who know and sense their identity, their, their, their worth is secure in God. They don't, they don't have to tell you about everything that they've accomplished and done because they don't need you to recognize how great they are. In fact, they don't need to speak that much. They're able to just listen to you and to reflect the character of Christ. And that's really what we're getting at, the character of Christ. Because it is Christ's character that infuses all of the virtues. Think of Philippians chapter 2. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but humbled himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, uh, he was exalted up at the name of God, and God has given them the name that above all names, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Think about that. Think about 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And so this is why the scriptures call us to love each other in humility and to live in humility. I mean, Ephesians 4, I beg you, lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. 1 Peter 5, 5, clothe yourselves with humility, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble in the Apocrypha, Sirach 1.27, For the fear of the Lord is wisdom and discipline. Fidelity and humility are his delight. So if we're living in humility, we are in fact living in the image of Christ. We are walking in the way of Jesus. Pride is the poison. Humility is the cure. Are you living in humility? So just look at your life. Does the way that you treat others reflect the humility of Christ? Does your speech reflect the humility of Christ? Do your Facebook posts reflect the humility of Christ? Or are they disrespectful of others? Where does your greatest sense of self-worth come from? Because it turns out that practicing humility simply means looking a little bit more like Christ. And growth in Christ-likeness 
comes from grace. We'll not be able to strong arm our hearts to humility, but we can become more aware of what's going on in our hearts, more open to Christ's grace, which is, in the end, to be more open to his transforming power and then to grow in humility. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen.